Good morning and welcome to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. I'm your pharmacist, Brad White. We're glad you joined us today. Before we begin, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Altman Health Systems, Studio Arts and Glass, and Genure Appraisals and Liquidations. Today, we're broadcasting from our administrative offices, and our guest is Dr. John Elias, Medical Director of Altman Now Urgent Care. Good morning, Dr. Elias, and welcome to the show. Morning. Thanks for having me. All too often, illness or injury appears out of the blue. You wake up in the middle of the night with intense abdominal pain. You stumble while carrying groceries up a flight of stairs. Maybe you can't put weight on that swollen ankle. Or your baby spikes a high fever over the weekend. When these situations occur, we're often faced with uncertainty about where to go for care, especially if the symptoms seem severe and our regular doctor's office is closed. While the answer is not always simple, Knowing the difference between a walk-in clinic, an urgent care center, and a hospital emergency room can make a huge difference, especially if you have a medical emergency. Today, we're going to talk with Dr. Elias and learn about the difference between emergency room and urgent care, while also discussing common health concerns during this cold and flu season. We'd like to remind our listeners today our program is also available on our podcast. Just look for Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy in your favorite podcast app, and please subscribe. Okay, Dr. Elias, welcome to the show. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and your training? Okay, well, um, pretty much grew up in Ohio. Uh, I did my undergraduate at Kent State, and then uh, Ohio State is where I got my medical degree. I uh, did uh, residency training at uh, Summa Barberton, and uh, then I actually went out west for uh, some years in Oregon and practiced did OB, did a lot of emergency room work while we were there. It was a full spectrum. Came back and taught uh, <clears throat> family medicine in Ohio for 14 years. And then I've been doing urgent care for 12. Um, in addition to medical directing at Altman now, I'm also the uh, medical director of Canton City Health. And <clears throat> I primarily do clinical work. So can you expand on that role at Altman and where you're located? So Altman has four facilities. One is in North Canton, and that is the larger facility where I primarily work. That is uh, Whipple and Dressler. And um, then we have satellite facilities. And at this time, we're at Louisville. We're at Jackson. <clears throat> and uh, uh, let's see, Louisville, Jackson, and Washington Square. Why am I, okay. Um, and uh, those are little smaller facilities, but um, we could expand some in the future. And we offer, so to differentiate, some of the walk-in clinics and some of the pharmacy associated clinics only see more simple cases. They don't do x-rays. They rarely will drain abscesses or close lacerations. And some of them you actually can book in. For us, we're, we are walk-in. You cannot book with us. And we are a fuller service type of urgent care. We do x-rays. We drain boils. We um, close lacerations. Um, we do minor emergent type, and we'll talk about that in a second. Things we don't do, and most urgent cares don't, are blood work, CT scans, and those are you know necessary. We don't do IVs, and we don't carry major pain medications. We only carry anti-inflammatory or Tylenol-type medications. So let's talk about a little bit more about urgent care versus the emergency department. I, I think, you know, both of us probably grew up in an environment where, God forbid something happened, you went to the ER. I mean, that's what there was. I mean, maybe you thought about calling your primary care doctor, but I guess in my time, it seemed like if you had a, what you felt was an emergency, you went to the ER. How does a person now in today's world know which place to go based on what they have going on? You know, the best guideline is, is this something severe? Do I think it's life-threatening? And if you think that, you should be going to the emergency department. You know, we also have limited hours. We close 7.30 uh, and on weekends at 5. 
but to be more specific, if you have a head injury, especially if you're over 65 and run a risk of bleeding, if you had any concussion symptoms, if it was simple, I hit my head, nothing happened, they just wanted me to get checked. I mean, we evaluate these, we just might have to refer somebody. If you had a major fracture, you think you fractured your spine, you think you fractured your hip, you shouldn't go. But most fractures, you know, wrist, hands, ankles, yeah, we'll see. We'll de determine whether it's a sprain or strain. If you're an OB patient, you shouldn't come there. We don't really have any OB equipment to evaluate if you're having some bleeding, uh, you know, issues like that. We don't do a lot of psychological issues. If you're suicidal, we don't, you know, we, we will handle whatever we can and refer as necessary. So we always accept people. But if it's severe, if you can't breathe well, if you have severe abdominal pain that will need a CT scan, if you have a severe burn, if you're having chest pain, you should go to the ER. If you have an uncomplicated burn, you have an ear issue, you something got in your eye, you got earwax issues, you have a boil that needs drained, you think you sprained something, maybe you fractured it. If you have a laceration, provided it's not uncontrolled bleeding and extensive, we're, we're your place. All right. So just in summary, what I'm hearing is, is if it's heart related or you think you're having a heart attack or you're having chest pains, or if you've got a compound fracture, or maybe you've got um, a head injury of some type, those are probably moving toward the ER. Right. And if you've got maybe a sprain or strain, or you feel crummy, or you got an earache, it's more urgent care. Is that fair? Yeah. That's fair. I mean, we, we, we do lacerate it's generalized, but right. I see a lot of belly abdominal pain that I'm fine with. Okay. You have a stomach flu, but you know, I do see diverticulitis. I do see gallbladder yeah. issues, appendicitis. Those have to be sent because they need lab work or CT. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, with that in mind, when should a person contact their primary care provider instead of an urgent care? Well, and that's a good question. I mean, your primary care provider is there. They know you. So it's continuity of care. It is, I need a refill of my medicine. You know, my blood pressure, I think, is getting out of whack. Let me uh, have that evaluated. Respiratory, my back is hurting me. I have a cold or maybe I have strep. Those are all fair game and they cross over with urgent care. But realistically, right now it's hard to get in in a timely fashion. So if you have a minor illness that can wait a little bit, if you need your refills on your medicines, immunizations, if you need screening for medical conditions, that's when you should go. I mean, you should always keep your primary care as the, the air traffic controller of your health. You know, with, with that being said, um, I think you've already answered my next question, but I think it's important that we talk about it briefly about how important it is for someone to have a primary care doctor. Um, you know, we see patients in the pharmacy at times and, you know, we've got this movement now with some insurance plans are like really high deductible or, or maybe people don't have insurance and they don't regularly go see a primary doctor or they don't have a primary doctor. And it kind of concerns me with respect to what you're talking about. Can you touch briefly on how important it is to have a primary care doctor? Well, you know, you really need somebody who knows you, who knows your medical conditions. Like, you know, there's some new medications, antivirals, where if there's kidney issues or liver issues, possibly you shouldn't be on them. The person who knows you best is the best <clears throat> caretaker for many issues. They're gonna screen you for age appropriate or condition appropriate or know your family history better to be able to screen you properly for diseases. Make sure you're up on your immunizations, et cetera. So, uh, you know, you're, make sure you're, you get all the screening for diabetes. There, it's an extremely important and you know, we wish we had more too. And I'm not saying this because I'm going to lose urgent care business, but you know, I started primary care in primary care and there's plenty of work to go around. So yes, we could use, always use more. Well, and, and we I, are, yeah. And I, and I don't ask that question to be threatening to your service because 
like between people's work schedules and school schedules, you know, sometimes the primary care doctor is booked up or maybe you just can't get there. So that's where I think it's perfect to have an urgent care solution like you guys offer. So that's, that's really helpful. Um, all right. Well, it's about quarter after, so it's time for our first commercial break. So you're listening to health matters with the medicine center pharmacy. We'll be right back in a little bit. Okay, welcome back to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. Uh, friends, don't forget to shop. Excuse me, friends, don't forget to stop into the Medicine Center Pharmacy for your flu or COVID booster. Uh, Walk ins are welcome, but we do accept appointments on our website. So just go to medshoprx.com, that's M E D S H O P R X.com, and schedule your flu, pneumonia, shingles, or COVID vaccine. Okay, Dr. Elias is joining us today from. Altman Now Urgent Care, and we're going to get on with our program today. You know, we've been really lucky with weather in November, and it's been wonderful, but I know flu season's coming, and the sickness seems to be ramping up. Can, can you talk a little bit about the differences between flu, COVID, common cold, and, and even some other things that might be floating around in the community right now that maybe we don't even know about yet? So... COVID and flu are very uh, specific compared to what we call a cold. So cold in the medical lingo is upper respiratory infection. And there's over 200 viruses that can cause these infections. I don't want to get too much into the details, but just to say rhinovirus is the number one. Other coronaviruses are number two. Number three is influenza that's just mild. So many viruses cause these, and some of them might go into the lower tract and cause a bronchitis, which is usually viral, or in the throat, causing a laryngitis, which is an inflammation of the throat, but it's also viral. So they have a little peculiar, but your standard common cold is more upper, and that's how it starts. Generally, it's in the nose, it's a scratchy throat. The secondary issue, you get a cough later on, usually they kind of get better in that realm too. So you usually have symptoms of a cold anywhere from three to 10 days. Uh, but the cough in uh, about a third of them will go on for weeks afterwards. That's not uncommon. Having a cough, not uncommon. Having nasal drainage that is yellow looking, not uncommon at all with a, a common cold. That does not tell you whether it's a bacteria or a virus. These are all important type of issues. So the main part about a cold is not as severe. That's kind of how we came up with this. You, you, adults usually don't get fevers with them. Children frequently do. An adult might get two to four of these per year. A child could get five to seven of them a year. So th this, these are common. And when someone says, I've got a sinus infection three times a year, they probably caught a common cold three times a year. There's, there's a difference between a bacterial sinus infection and a viral sinus infection, which is the common cold. Um, flu, there's mainly, there is actually A, B, and C, but mostly it's A and B. So there's two main strains within them. There's several, several subspecies. It is a sudden illness. You get a fever suddenly. You get severe fatigue. You get severe muscle aches. Now, not everybody gets this. Along with it, you get a sore throat, nasal congestion, and it tends to go into lower respiratory. A flu, unlike people think, is a stomach virus, which is a viral gastroenteritis. And a lot of people think that, a huge number, rarely gets the gastrointestinal tract, except in kids. And still, it's maybe 10%. It is preventable with the flu vaccine, which, by the way, has been out since World War II. It's tried and true. Um, does it prevent it 100%? Absolutely not. You know, if it's a 60% coverage, that's a good year. Um, does it keep you from having a severe illness, hospitalizations, mortality? Yes. Um, there's also treatments for it, and it's really way too much detail probably for here, but we have antivirals. If you're a high risk patient, especially, 
you should probably be treated. You're in a nursing home. You're greater than 65. You're less than five. Those are definitely people that could be treated. If it's a severe illness, you want to get on that within 48 hours usually. And then testing. They don't really recommend testing unless you're going to do something with the information. If you might treat it, if you work in a nursing home or you're in a nursing home or you have chronic respiratory diseases, that's when you test. You don't test everybody um, when you know it's out. Now, all these are a little bit off because of COVID, which is something that makes us want to know specifically what virus we're dealing with. COVID, quickly, we I've heard, I don't want to concentrate on this today because there's a lot of it. It really can have, especially with the new variant, minor cold symptoms. It would also be added to one of those species, anywhere from that to flu symptoms to still the inflammatory lung conditions and blood clot conditions that it causes. It doesn't do that as much as we get more species involved. It keeps uh, having some variations to it. And the old variations are seeming to go away, which is great. And the newer ones are not as lethal. So, you know, when do you check? I mean, if you're suspicious, you got to look at specific things with it. I cannot any longer tell the difference when, in my work what they have. If I need to know because they work at a nursing home or grandpa's on chemotherapy, I'm going to want to do that test. If they say I'm achy, I lost taste and smell, I'm going to do it. Now, some of these people come back flu A, flu B. Some of them come back RSV, which can act like a flu also and does affect adults, hmm. not just children. I think it's, uh, I I'd like you to touch on one thing before we go on to our next comment. And that is, can you talk about the flu vaccine? You mentioned it's been around since World War II. Uh, I still think there is a lot of misinformation with people that believe in their heart that they get a flu vaccine and they get the flu. Can you please comment on that? Yeah. I mean, with the exception of the nasal, it's a dead virus that you're giving. People do, in fact, get sick. We give the flu shot. We, you know, target is going to be September, October, maybe early November. At those times, school's in session. There's a lot of issues, you know, uh, going around, people congregating. Other illnesses are out there. You might get sick, and you might even catch the flu, for that matter, because it takes a little bit of time for you to get the immunity. But you will not get influenza from the shot. It's a dead virus. In the rare times it's live, it's attenuated, it should not cause it. And we don't give that to people uh, over 50 anyways. If anything, maybe a little stronger one, and you're aware, over age 65, they have the high strength. Yeah. I just, I think it's important to touch on that. You know, there's some polarizing beliefs or ideas now about different vaccines. And I just, I think the thing that concerns me the most is people die every year from the flu. People die every year from pneumonia. And we have vaccines for these things that can at least give you a chance. You already commented, it may not keep you from getting the flu, but it sure ought to keep you from getting it as severe as you could if you didn't get it at all. So, you know, if you don't, if you have questions, call, give us a call at the pharmacy, talk to your primary care doctor, you know, you know, just ask questions and be informed and make sure that you're informed in the right way. So, um, you know, you touched on treatments for cold and flu and COVID, you know, or maybe not COVID, but, you know, why don't, um, do you have any tips for people, you know, you mentioned if you think you have the flu, that there's antivirals available that can help. And generally those antivirals will help decrease the length of time you have your illness. But it also means you don't put off getting seen by urgent care or your primary care doctor. So can you touch base maybe when the best time to seek treatment is and when to be tough and see if you can ride something out? And that's, a, that's actually kind of difficult because some of the problems you want to get on, you want to get treated. If you're going to be treated for uh, COVID with Paxlovid, you want the first five days. If you want flu, you want the first two days. Although, honestly, if you have risk factors, if you're hospitalized, if it's serious flu, they're going to use it after 48 hours, the antivirals. So if it's a mild 
cold and it's not focalized, meaning my ear is not hurting me. This is just in my throat. I can't breathe. If you have the standard runny nose, cough, even a stuffed up nose, that is not you know an issue in the beginning anyways. You don't have any high fevers. You wanna nurse that along for, they don't recommend antibiotics for sinusitis for 10 days of regular cold symptoms. Nurse it along, treat what you think is a common cold like that. That if it tells you, something tells you, what if it's an ear infection? What if it's a strep? What if this is flu because I'm really sick? You know, you'll probably miss some of the mild flus because it acts, it is a cold in a lot of, in a lot of ways, but you wouldn't have needed treatment anyways. And that might be true with COVID. Some people get no symptoms from COVID or they just get a headache. You might miss some. We're not going to be perfect with it. So, you know, it's about severity. Very good. Okay, it's the bottom of the hour and time for the news. Thank you for joining us with for Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. We'll be right back after the news. Welcome back to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. I'm your host and pharmacist, Brad White. This morning, we're talking with Dr. John Elias, Medical Director of Altman Now Urgent Care. We have a lot more to cover this morning, so let's get back to the show. I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about antibiotics this morning. Um, I think many of us grew up knowing that, oh, I'm feeling sick. I got to go to the doctor and get an antibiotic. But that isn't always the case anymore. So can you maybe talk about antibiotics, where they're appropriate, what you're seeing right now in the in the community? And, you know, are there applications right now where you're seeing illness that those apply to? Well, absolutely, but antibiotic stewardship is quite important. You know, we're hearing about superbugs and coronavirus kind of pushed that to the side. We'll be hearing about them again. Our antibiotics are not working the way they used to. So things like common colds, or you could call it a viral sinusitis, no antibiotics. How about bronchitis? It's not pneumonia. Antibiotics not recommended because several studies show they don't work. Laryngitis, they don't work. Bronchiolitis, they don't work. There's four main things we wanna treat and use the antibiotics responsibly for. Pneumonias, that's one. Strep throat, that requires an antibiotic. And mainly it's uh, the, the most important part is you do not wanna get rheumatic fever. So there's some side effects and use of antibiotics greatly reduces the risk of getting rheumatic fever. Then there's ear infections. Still, most ear infections get better if given time, but in the US especially, we generally treat it. The toughest one is sinusitis. If you have persistent nasal congestion for 10 days or greater than an antibiotic is indicated. If you have had a condition for six days or longer where it's starting to improve and then got worse, the reinfection, absolutely antibiotics. And then if it's single-sided, persisting more than a couple of days with fever, you know, focal, like I was talking about, it, then yes, antibiotics. Otherwise, all those other illnesses, we should not be using antibiotics. And the more we use them, the more risk it is for our future. All right. Well, thank you for that. Because I, I know there's still, I still have conversations in the pharmacy where people are like, I went to the doctor, they wouldn't give me an antibiotic. And I'm like, well, it's probably viral. It's not going to help. So it's it's always, I think it's it can still be confusing for patients and it takes just education, which is important. Um, can you talk a little bit about the pulmonary effects of colds and flu and COVID? So colds usually don't go into the lungs. I mean, you can cough, but it's usually from drainage. Uh, influenza will frequently have some effect on the lungs. And the initial COVID strains predominantly were in the lungs, and that's where the mortality was. They still do that, but not as often. Uh, the strains more recently, the Omicron and the variants of Omicron tend to be more upper. But uh, so, you know, respiratory wise, yes, they go into the upper areas. But what we worry about is the lower pulmonary. And it's tough to explain, but our body's immune reaction to things like flu and COVID or what caused some of the destruction of the tissue. Hmm. It's kind of scary, isn't it? Yeah. So, you know, we've got, 
cooler weather coming here this next week. And I have a friend in North Dakota that uh, was telling me they had 20 inches of snow yesterday. I hope that's not coming our way. But uh, can you talk maybe about some of the medical risks for cooler weather? Um, you know, we're going to have probably more risk for common colds and things. And and maybe you can talk to what we could do to prepare ourselves for this, the coming season. Okay. Can I just mention one thing about antibiotics? So the risk yeah, are yeah. resistant bacteria. You can ha get yeast infections. You can have a severe allergy. And the worst is probably killing friendly bacteria getting a bad diarrhea, one C. diff, which is potentially lethal. Now, as far as the cold weather, it colds are not related to cold weather. So we know that for sure. Um, they've tested extensive. Now people do congregate inside. They do, uh, schools are open during that time. We definitely have a seasonality and it happens to be when it's colder, but cold itself does not cause the cold but there are a lot of dangers. There's hypothermia, there is frostbite, there's a lot of falls, the ice is out there. These are uh, some issues also like shoveling snow. People don't think about it. So first of all, as far as avoiding falls, it's a lot of it's common sense. They talk about security, know your environment, you know? Don't reach if you have a purse, don't reach into your push and not be looking what's around. That's all security, but that's important for falls. So look, you wear good shoes. You don't wear stilettos. You know, you, you wear good solid boots. You, if there's ice out, you do the short shuffling type of walk. Keep your hands free. Don't be fooling with things. Your hand might be, your arm might be something you could grab onto and not, you know, have a serious injury. And, you know, salt things too. Or if you don't want to use salt, use kitty litter. I mean, you know, pets, they do have pet friendly salt. I realize it's kind of a pain, you track it in, but it could save your life. And I mean, hip fractures, or there's a lot of mortality associated with that. Head injuries, especially in over age 65. These are all significant issues. You know, if you don't mind, I'd like to take like just a second to talk about falls in general. Um, many times we talk about pa with patients in the pharmacy about their medications, and we kind of do a medication review with them to make sure they understand what they're all for. And, and sometimes when we're talking to patients, it comes out that um, they just happen to tell me that, well, you know, I usually kind of have to be careful around my house because sometimes I'll slip and fall once or twice a week. And, you know, they're like, oh, I'm getting older and, you know, I'm just more prone to falling. And, and I think it's important for the listeners today to realize that you need to be cognizant that it's a problem. Um, be, be aware that falling is not necessarily normal. I, I mean, as we get older, you know, we maybe lose some muscle strength or maybe some ability to, to focus on our gait. But, you know, don't be so proud as to not take advantage of devices like a cane or a walker or get rid of those rugs on the floor. Um, you know, doctor just mentioned, you know, all the hazards with snow and ice. But boy, you don't want to trip on your rug in your house and fall and hit your head or in the bathroom or, or, or injure your hip or something. So just be aware that your medications could affect your ability to keep your balance when you get up quickly from a chair. So just be aware that, you know, talk to your pharmacist, talk to your primary care doctor, make sure you're aware that falling is, can be dangerous. So be careful out there. There's no shame in a cane. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, now so, you were going to, uh, as far as like shoveling snow, did you want me to touch on that too? Yeah, or? please, please do. Because, you know, I know we all love shoveling snow in Ohio and when they're wet and heavy, boy, it gets, it's a workout more than people realize. I think please do. It's a huge workout. So in the morning, anyways, you wake up, there's things called catecholamines. They are things that constrict your blood pressure, make your heart rate. There's more heart attacks in the morning anyways. That's when people shovel. You start shoveling and within two minutes, your heart rate and your blood pressure can be the equivalent of being on a treadmill for two minutes that, or for being on a treadmill at the maximum amount. There's a huge stress on your heart. 
At the same time, you're, convict, you're constricting blood vessels to your hands and feet. You're not getting circulation in other places. Your heart is working harder. Your oxygen demand is harder. You uh, <clears throat> are at severe risk for heart attacks, and they are increased. Now, when should you not? I mean, one cardiologist said if you're over 45, now I, I still shovel it some too. But, you know, I think if you're at 55 and you have some issues, you ought to be thinking about it. You know, um, maybe not do it right in the morning. Maybe warm up a little bit, get your circulation working. Take breaks. I mean, if you're in shape, that's good. If you're not in shape and you just come out of nowhere, you're going to be at increased risks. And, you know, there's practical things. Snow's heavy. Shove it. You know, just kind of push it and scoot it along. Don't mm -hmm. pick it up each time for your workout. Having a workout in bad weather is a bad idea. So, um, yeah, we had our fair share of heavy snow last year, and that was – it's amazing how much exertion you can put forth. So it's a lesson to be, to be heated. You know, also, I guess you touched a little bit earlier on frostbite, but what about exposure to cold? You know, um, how, how long should we let our kids play outside in the snow? How should we, what signs and symptoms should we watch for, for frostbite risks? Well, so yes, children are at risk. Elderly people are at risk. Homeless people are at risk. Mm -hmm. Um, there are other risk factors. Um, alcohol. Alcohol dilates blood vessels. It makes you lose heat. That's bad. Smoking constricts them, and in that way, you're not getting as good a blood supply. Um, when you go outside, you are going to be at increased risks, uh, <clears throat> you know, um, of hypo hyperthermia. So you have to think about these issues. So. First of all, you know, kids don't realize when they're going to get cold. So, you know, you have to make sure they're dressed appropriately. Again, boots, mittens are better than gloves. Um, you want to go layers too. So one of the issues is things that make cold worse happen to be getting wet, for instance. So if you're over expending yourself, over exerting yourself, and you get wet, that's going to be an issue. That's going to make you lose heat much quicker. Um, certain things, um, touching metal, so the conductive surface you're on, where the ground, you can get frostbite in a matter of minutes. So, really, how long you should be out really depends on how cold it is and whether you're getting wet, whether you're, you know, able to wear, uh, the layers appropriately, you lose heat also through the, you know, some of us lose, you know, more than others, but through your head, you lose an amazing amount. It's a, it's amazing how much heat you can trap by wearing a hat because your body, when you start to have issues, it's going to start shunting that blood into the center and you're going to lose uh, circulation. Now, um, I'm not sure if we have a break soon or you want me to go into some of the frostbite. Uh, yeah, we, I definitely want to talk about frostbite, but let's take our last commercial break. Um, thank you for joining us for Health Matters. We'll be right back after this commercial message. Thanks. Okay, welcome back to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. We're going to wrap up our last segment of the show talking with Dr. Elias from Altman Urgent Care. All right, doctor, we were going to talk about frostbite. Um, what would you like to talk about with frostbite? Well, I mean, uh, it, it can be quite serious. It, it, there's something called frost nip where you get pale fingers burning, you rewarm, everything goes away within 10 minutes. That's frost nip. Frostbite is destruction of tissue. And there's just like a burn, there's just the surface, blistering, full skin, and you know, into the tissue below. And it can be quite severe. If you get a severe frostbite, your body's immune reaction can cause constriction of blood vessels, blood clots to form. So just to be aware, if you get severe frostbite, and I'll tell you what to look for, there are times you need to get into the emergency department. There is treatment that could save your limb. Otherwise, 
you know, if you wait too long, there's nothing you can do. So as a guideline, if you get frostbite, you want to rewarm. You will do it mainly in lukewarm or body temperature water, you know, less than 90 degrees. You don't want to cause a burn on already hurt skin. You don't want to use a heater type of element, which could accidentally burn you. And you want to avoid trauma. You don't, if, you, if your feet are frostbitten, if somebody can carry you or uh, yeah. not put weight on it, you, when you have that destruction, you don't want to add trauma to it because that is something that could not be reversible. And you never want to rewarm if there's a chance it could get frozen again. To refreeze is the death of the tissue. So as a guideline, if after you rewarm, it's just a little bit red on your finger, still a little swollen, a little red. That's grade one frostbite. That's okay, just watch it. If you get any purple looking, any psychosis, you need to get evaluated immediately. If it's anything more than the tip, you'll probably have to require some aggressive therapy for this. Hmm. Wow. Maybe it's also time to take just a second and say, you know, as colder temperatures approach, you know, make sure that you've got a blanket in your car in case something happens or you've got your gloves and hat always as backup. You know, we always seem to find ourselves with in places where we wish we had something and we don't have it. So plan ahead so that if you have car trouble, you're not stuck out in the snow somewhere. So I think we ought to take some time here to talk about um, where the Altman Urgent Care Facilities are located and how listeners can get some more information about them. Um, I'm guessing that you can help us with, um, you know, websites or a phone number and um, please, please share with the listeners so that we can make sure we can take advantage of these valuable services in the community. Okay. And basically our hours, they're all the same at all the locations. So we're open from eight to seven 30 on weekdays and nine to five on weekends. We're open. Most holidays We're usually closed on Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, um, and uh, we do have limited hours there. You can find all this on the Ottman.org. Again, we mentioned Washington Square, Louisville, Jackson, and the main hub, which is in North Canton. Um, you can look and see if there's an alteration of hours. We do not schedule uh, visits. You cannot go online, but we have a wonderful app, and uh, I'm going to go on here. And it's called Altman Anywhere. Oh, okay. And if you hit the Altman app, there's a urgent care wait time, little hourglass right here. Okay. Uh, you can hit the wait times. And then you can go to Altman uh, Now Telemedicine. Uh, it says Altman Now Telehealth. We do telehealth. Now, it'll ask you to put another... <clears throat> app in called Altman now team you know, telehealth. We do that. We're so busy. I got to be honest. We're not doing much of that. We don't have time to do that. It does go to other contracted physicians that will do the telehealth visit for you. If we're slow down at any time, then yes, we're available for that also. You know, I we 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 have about four minutes left. Is it appropriate for you to maybe make a quick comment on what a telehealth, what might be appropriate for a telehealth visit versus going into the urgent care? Because sometimes I wonder where you draw the line, but maybe telehealth will tell you that. Well, so, I mean, they, they probably will tell you that. Most of your diagnosis is done through history, at least your suspicion. But certainly if you need to look in that ear, yeah, there's no way you can do that online. I mean, treating a strep, you're really supposed to get the test for the strep. Okay. But what about I've had a nasal congestion this long, it's been 10 days. Okay, well, that's probably a sinusitis. What about this skin rash? You can literally show them the skin rash, you know? Yeah, sure. Uh, what about maybe abdominal pain? Are you vomiting? Do you have fever? There's some things like there's called peritoneal signs where if you get jogged, it really hurts. You know, can the patient kind of jump up and it doesn't hurt them? Probably not an appendicitis. I okay. mean, there are actually little clues you can use with telemedicine to uh, guide your therapy. Um, but, you know, if it's a short-lived 
I just had this uh, respiratory infection and you're not reporting fevers and your vitals seem okay, you might just hear, I think this is viral. We probably don't need an antibiotic for it. That's what I, that's what I hope we're hearing. Yeah, because, sure. you know, I want antibiotics to work when we need them, you know, and if we overuse them, they're not going to work. It, it's okay to let your body take care of this and use medications that we've been using for years to help control the symptoms, you know? Yeah. You mentioned like for coughs, one of the things is I didn't mention, I didn't go through the treatments of colds on here, you know, but yeah, honey works. And I know at the pharmacy, you have a lot of formulations of honey and it hurt, you know, helps quite well, as long as the child is at least over one year of age. Yeah. And so. even gargling with salt water for sore throats, you know, some of these things, it doesn't always have to be a drug, right? So. No, no, it doesn't. And they have. Well, you know, as we wrap up here, do you have any, um, any parting comments you want to leave with the listeners about as we enter cold and flu season or about Altman, Altman now urgent care? Well, you know, we don't want to ever discourage somebody or this is not bad enough to, you know, it's just a cold. If you're worried about something, that's good enough reason. You don't have to say, well, I haven't had it this long or I'm not here. If, if you have a condition and you just want reassurance for it, it's okay. You're not hurting anybody to come see us. You should never get a feeling from any provider, hey, you should have just gone home. This is a waste of time. It's never a waste of time if you have concerns about your health to have it evaluated. That's what we're here for. We're here to bridge the gap between primary care and emergency room. And yes, we see the small things and that's okay. That's why we're here. Excellent. Well, thank you very much to our guest, Dr. John Elias, Medical Director of Altman Now Urgent Care. We'd like to remind our listeners, if you suspect you have a medical issue, please contact your healthcare provider. Thanks to our sponsors, Altman Health Systems, Studio Arts and Glass, Genuary Appraisals, and Liquidations. As always, thanks for joining us for Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. Have a healthy week, and we'll be here next week at News Talk 1480 WHBC. Thanks, doctor, very much. Have thank a great you. day. You too.